Hi, David. So we have uh, Don Brinninger today. And he has Don is somebody that I could listen to talk about music and about theories of pitch and conducting all day. Oh, that sounds great. <laughs> 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 oh my god and so he has a theory a, a theory of um choral intonation called perfect pitch is that am i saying that right i think this is actually his invention <laughs> and he can apply it at any level um it's very much related to timbre um it comes from many many experience conducting and teaching and of course being a world-renowned tenor in the early part so he's quite a force and like and he's the chorus master of pasadena symphony correct the or, we use the don brannigan singers oh right uh, okay he often combines with the jpl singers that he started uh, <laughs> for a larger group so we we use them occasionally with the symphony and then um the thing that we most love doing together is this uh, this uh, candlelight Christmas program. Oh, nice! Very nice. Which is very much fun. It's just sort of like a collage program with different choruses and orchestra and soloists and the very special seasonal. Yeah, it sounds incredible. Have you been productive today or not productive? Oh yeah, I've only been productive really. Um, I've just been flying through the piece. So maybe in a couple of weeks we can do a, I'm almost there. Right. It's really interesting that now that I look over the whole thing, it seems to be much more plugged in now. And I thought, oh, isn't that interesting? Because I'm not fitting it around my crazy lifestyle. Uh -huh. But if it was just, you know, it's just the piece really in my Zoom and, you know, chatting with some friends. But otherwise I'm just doing that, which is what I always used to do. Yeah, right. Well, you can imagine how hard it would be for, you know, the big creative geniuses like Mahler or Bernstein, where they're conducting on the road, or Esa Pekka, you know, and then trying to write a piece at the same time. Right. Yeah. Well, but a lot of them, I don't know about Esa Pekka, he's writing at an airport, but the rest of them were in little composing cabins. Yes. Strauss, too. They had this wonderful, like, oh, and I'll have my wife come, and then I'll have some go and come and cook and clean, and... Right. So that too, I'm thinking, okay, I mean, obviously they're great geniuses, but they had just like silver platter. <laughs> Lots of <laughs> I was reading something, it was one of the list books. And I mean, if you came to his place, he had a, this woman would answer the door and just be like, the master doesn't see anyone today. The master's not seen anyone until three and the master this, the ma and I'm like, Who's doing that at my door? They don't even have to say master, but here it's just like knock, call, lure me out. I'll probably do it. But it, wouldn't that be wonderful? Just to have somebody guarding the door? Of course. <laughs> well, people call me maestro, but I'm never quite sure if they're saying it. Um... <laughs> <laughs> maestro. Oh, yeah, they absolutely are. But wouldn't that be wonderful? I mean, no wonder these people got stuff done. We had a whole network in place. That's right. Uh, anyways, so okay. speaking of list, I'm reading this fascinating book. I just actually sent it to Enon. Um, and it's about the three iterations of the etudes he did, finally turning into the transcendental etudes. Oh, wow. It's off the charts. It's just off the charts on how he implemented virtuosity, cultural norms, his own development and then they're comparing all three versions and the first one was when he was he was 15 then he did another set when he was 26 and then the transcendental etudes when he was 40. so you have this unbelievable all the same material so this unbelievable scope to see the development of an artist wow isn't that incredible it's just off the charts so i'm oh. having fun with that I didn't realize he was so young when he wrote the Transcendental Etudes. Well, the first version. They originally were called um, uh, 12, 12 Etudes, yeah. Etude on Deux Exercises. So 1826, yeah, he was 15. <laughs> he already mastered the piano. And then he, they just got more difficult. When did he write, how old was he when he wrote the Anne de Pellegrinage? 
That, I think that's 1850s. I'd have to look. That's when he was running around. Well, I think that's when he was in Rome a lot, wasn't he? Well, that was at the end. Well, he was all over the, you know, all over Europe. Yeah. In fact, that's kind of what I think why he, you know, when he just finally retired. Yeah. I always thought that didn't, didn't quite make sense. And I don't have any proof of this, but I think he was starting to have a little bit too much trouble with women and the audience. And I think he was getting a little lost in the celebrity. This is my intuition. Yeah. Because it didn't make sense that he, and then he would later take minor orders. He was like putting everything in place so that he could just not, you know, a literal rock star come off the yeah. stage and just be like, I mean, they were throwing themselves at him, like literally. <laughs> yeah. yeah, well, music's a powerful thing. Yeah, yeah, so, yeah, so is the male psyche. Hello. Hi there. Um, do you know Brett? I Hi, don't. John. Well, we might, I play viola, so I think we ah, asked yes, yes. one another somewhere yep. along. Absolutely. Yeah. Hey, the beard Nice is, to see you. Yeah, it's, it's going to get longer. <laughs> it's really, really good, yes. <laughs> are, you up, are you being a mountain man right now, or are you, where are you? I'm in uh, Rancho Cucamonga. Okay. My home down below, it's, we had three foot of snow on... Saturday up in the mountains, and I don't want to play with that. Oh, I see, yeah. I saw they were turning people away up in the mountains. Yeah, yeah, it's hard to get up there right now. So, Don, I'm really fascinated by the Brinker vocal arts and your perfect pitch and your theory of practice and choral intonation. Can, uh -huh. can we talk about all that at some point today? Yeah. Um, the How? pitch perfect thing is kind of a historical look at... Um, you know, how we've come to understand pitch and how we come to use pitch today. And what I'm really interested in for my choir is that because we often are the part of another experience, for instance, we've sung with a Balinese um, gamelan a choir. And the director of that group was a little bit amazed that my group was able to find one third of a pitch <laughs> differential. And I said, well, it's building contextual tuning. In other words, um, and you notice this between strings and brass and winds, there's, there's always this little bit of a fight of who's going to own the tuning. And the brass will tend to move towards a, a form of just intonation while the mm -hmm. strings will stay in tuning in perfect fifths. So, I mean, orchestra directors have been struggling with this since the day that, that you had consorts, right? Mm -hmm. And um, it turns out that um, historically, we can document 750 different discrete pitches within an octave that have been used musically. Wow. And, and we have not just ornamentally. Not ornamentally, just no. actual uh, scalar related pitches. Wow. And, and of course, a lot of it depends on the timbre of the instrument. Um, the, all tunings tend to be specifically focused on the timbre of the instruments. Mm. So uh, piano, being a percussion instrument, is going to be oriented towards perfect fifth tuning because all the fifths are detuned a little bit. But the major thirds, major sixths, and sevenths are not so nice mm. comparatively. And then again, a, a string player will struggle with a pianist when you're getting to those particular intervals, you know, who's <laughs> in general. the one that's going to sweeten it. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Well, I noticed with my viola, David, you probably noticed that my viola is happier low. I, if I'm playing by myself, I just tune it all low. And it, it just... It's practically telling me it's happy. Oh, isn't that interesting? I have a terrible time sitting in the bow of the piano, trying to play with the bass line of the piano. Oh, God. I've always thought, <laughs> <No>. <laughs> well, as far as I'm concerned, as far as the piano is concerned, I never play in tune. But to my ear, I'm playing in tune, but it's just way too colorful. <laughs> mm. Well, the way, the way you're expressing that, David, is exactly right. We do choose our tunings after a while, and most of it is our own instrument bias. Mm. Um, the problem for singers is, is uh, double-fold. One, it's a musicianship issue. We don't have a button to push to approximate the pitch so that over time we begin to appreciate a certain pitch. We're constantly floating around in the ether a little bit. So the book was designed to help singers contextualize the pitch um, to look at a conductor and say, what kind of tuning are they asking me for? And we do this primarily through the timbre of our vowels. Um, 
So the text, part. the text plays an important role. The text plays an essential role, mm. absolutely, as well as the mode. Um, mm. For instance, if we're in a Lydian mode, uh, that tends to brighten the texture of the sound, and if we're in Phrygian mode, that darkens the texture. So mm. the singers have to be sensitive to it. Uh, not so important that my singers understand the theory per se, but that they're willing to bend and move as a conductor, mm. ask them to do different things, and that they have the aural flexibility to do that dependably. Hmm. Now you, you started uh, having a big career as a young person all over the world um, as, a, as a dramatic tenor? I, I would describe my sounds more as a lyric tenor, more Good. of a Bach evangelist tenor. Okay, so, um, so how much of these ideas did you have in place when you were performing all the time? Not, not a one. <laughs> I think I used my own intuitive musicality. How did it evolve then? Did it evolve as you started to teach? or It evolved because a graduate student working with me said, you know, I really appreciate the fact you like things in tune, but you're not very efficient at it. And I said, what do you mean? <laughs> well, I said, I said, I said well, what, what do you mean? He says, you don't know what you're doing, but you get there eventually. <laughs> what, she was, what she was saying is that I had a preference and I knew what I wanted and I, and I had a sense of aesthetic understanding and it just took some rehearsal drill. With the theory now, I can actually call that out immediately and recontextualize it for the singer and, and this comes from an analytical point of view. Mm -hmm. and, and so I, I have my David Locking hidden tuning. Uh, the tuning that I, I know you like, and I try to develop my choir sound towards that um, because we'll have a slightly flatter affect in, in our own a cappella singing when you're not in front of us and you appreciate a, a slightly more raised uh, third and, and sixth. And so I try to get my choirs to do that for you flexibly. Yeah. Yeah, I, I, I appreciate that. It cuts, cuts down on rehearsal time. That's it does. Sure. That's exactly. It's, a, it's about efficiency more than anything yeah. else. But the thing that absolutely delighted me and blew me away is when I saw you apply these ideas effortlessly with young people. Yeah. I saw you do a, 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 a sort of master class as people were going into their end of, end of year performances. And, um, and, Somehow, well, you mesmerized me, but I think you—I think you hypnotized them. <laughs> <laughs> well, the, there is a word in the vocabulary that we use that that comes out of um, Mahali Shiksemahali. I don't know if you know that name. He's the flow is my yeah the flow <laughs> right exactly, and he also is the head of the Drucker Institute out of Claremont Colleges now, out of Harvard, and he a key word for him his entrainment entrainment. Mm. which means your your ability to focus in. And, and I think what you witnessed, David, is I didn't give the students many options to look about and be wandering mm. around. I gave them a very specific timbre and uh, relationship between pitches that they could kind of grab a hold of. And um, for them, it's kind of mind expanding because that's not something common to their experience. And when they experience, it's very sentient. And I think it's kind of what hooked all of us into music. You know, we play our instrument, we get a resonant sound, and we pair it with somebody else, and all of a sudden, you know, synergy mm -hmm. takes place. And I think what you were seeing is, you know, I've been teaching this now for 50 years, and you, you have a way of getting people to entrain, and then the synergy takes place, and then it kind of takes care of itself. <laughs> it's a beautiful process. It really is. I want to ask Brett, when you're composing, do you hear a certain kind of pitch center or so relationships between pitches, maybe even depending on the piece you're writing? Mm, sometimes. No, usually I just see it. I see like as if someone put the music in front of me. Yeah. I, but I don't have, I mean, I play the viola. I would love to have what Don's talking about with the viola. <laughs> 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 I think I'm doing it naturally. I don't even know what I do. Yes, <laughs> talked about this before, but you're writing a piece for uh, Jim Thatcher, our principal horn. Uh, so it's a solo piece with strings and two halves. Um, are you <laughs> speaking about tuning? My gosh, are you featuring the the, the natural intonation of the horn, or are you? Nope. <laughs> it's probably because it scares me, but. Um, 
I know, I guess it, you could say that it's going against the horn in that way. But um, no, I, this is something I've always wanted to have is a command over the octave like that. And when I played, I did some early music at USC. And you get a little bit of that quarter comma and I played VL, which is a nightmare because it's tuned in, it was tuned in fourths. <laughs> yep, yep. And everyone always asks me what, to give them the pitch to the singers. And it's just, it's going right. to take, take a minute. That's right. Um, but yeah, there's a very sophisticated temperament happening, obviously, in early music. But the system you're talking about sounds like, for, for me, it was just, it was overwhelming. It just, let's, you know. I well, it starts to, to get into the math of it, and that mm -hmm. gets people's heads spinning. And I, I do think, though, that when you compose, and I'm not wanting to put words in your mouth, but I think you are, you're reaching <laughs> for colors. Yes. You're, you're reaching for colors, and the affect of color is, in fact, tuning. Right. Um, yes. And in the imagination of the players that will play your score, they'll have to – what what I try to do for the choral community is say, look, the composer has a color in mind. And we do have analytical t tools, which we can use through these tuning systems to kind of figure that out. How do they stack the chord? How do they invert it? How do they um, uh, orchestrate it? Um, who are the voices that are playing at a particular time? Now, All of those are part of the message. Does this help your singers say, sing something that's atonal? Well, that's an interesting question because the uh, I use movable dough with my singers. Um, uh, as a practicality, but to sing atonal music, you would have to actually sing um, uh, fixed dough mm -hmm. because there is no tonal center to rest dough on. You so you have, have to use reference. that approach. Yeah. And I've not preferred doing the music of, of atonality per se, although I'm uh, very acquainted with set theory and I know how to mm -hmm. operate all that. Um, part, uh, part of my dissertation I did on Krennic's Lamentations of Jeremiah, which is... Well, there you go. There you go. I mean, <laughs> and there's not many That's people, at the edge. That's yeah. a, the very edge. <laughs> yeah. Um, yeah, so Ernst, Ernst, Ernst Krennic, Krennic is someone that we really studied back in the 70s at SC. Mm. He was part of the whole new scene then. I hate right, to say right. it in a way, but he was. <laughs> I met his widow in Palm Springs in, I think, the early... Early two thousands, wow. so I got all yeah, I got all wrapped up in that. But um, but when I started to look at the choral works, like okay, this is <laughs> this is insane. Yeah, you know, you're asking for a very high level of musicianship, and you're asking for people that can rest on their intervallic um, understanding. Mm. And um, you know, I sang a lot of that music. Um, I did especially a lot of Britain, which is not mm. atonal per se, but it's certainly. When you do the serenade for horn and tenor, there's a lot. The bass player turned to me and he said, "He said, how are you getting your pitches?" And I said, <laughs> "Not from you." <laughs> <laughs> yeah, definitely not from you. <laughs> so, you know, it's it's um, it, it's a task in mental agility, I think, to be able to do that. Mm. And I don't particularly train my singers. Um, to be effective at that kind of at that kind of music, I do think you need a special set of singers. We recently did a piece that had those qualities, and it was a tall learning curve for us. Mm. Uh, it was an Ellen Reed um, piece mm. that we did as, at the installation of the hundredth anniversary of the LA Philharmonic, and it's impressive the, what she accomplished with that. But definitely, you had to turn on your innovalic, um mm. appreciation, not your your tuning per se. You, you know, right. pitches were absolute. Hmm. I uh, I was just reading a um, uh, a draft of your new book about conducting teaching uh -huh. conduct and um, you've taught hundreds of students choral conducting right yes I have yeah <laughs> so how I mean that's a challenge in itself but how do you get choral conductors to feel comfortable conducting orchestral musicians in concert together. Yeah, well, you know, there's a tremendous fear factor that, that goes on in that community about this. Yeah. And, and quite frankly, honestly, I think it's partly a musicianship issue. And I think the other thing is that we tend to think of choirs needing music educators and, and uh, instrumental ensembles needing conductors. Um, 
and and so choral people tend to carry around their teacher chops all the time because they feel they have to feed people notes and things like that. Hmm. Whereas if you stand before a competent um, group of instrumentalists, they're gonna they're gonna play the notes on the page, and you're helping to shape and inspire and and those kinds of things, and you're not teaching. I mean, rarely would you teach, and if you did, they resent it anyway, right? Um, one of I the think, things, yeah, I, go ahead. One of the things that I notice about choral conductors is that the conducting is much more geared towards the expression of the phrase, and not so much about the carving up of the the measure, the particular measure. You know, the the joke about orchestra musicians is that you know. All we need is one. Just give us one. Uh, and then everything else is fine. Isn't that but, true? <laughs> <laughs> I would say that for more, more, most orchestral musicians, they wish the conductor wasn't there. Mm -hmm. uh, I, I, <laughs> I, I, as a trumpet player, you know, there are some conductors you could depend on to be there for you, and others you just had to play your part and carry yeah. on. Um, and I, that's not untrue in the choral community. Uh -huh. Well, what I was going to say, though, is that quite oftentimes you very rarely see a one from a choral conductor anywhere. Everything mm -hmm. is all sort of uplift and, and circular. Yeah, part of that is, is just the issue of where the instrument lies. The instrument's in the throat, and therefore it needs motivation through breath flow. And so there's a tendency for us to have gestures that, that in my book you've read that, it, that I call from gestures. Rather than the point of the beat, you're going to a place and then you're in somewhat like a taffy pull, you're, mm. you're encouraging the breath to flow into the phrase. And you can add to that that the hand can have some character of shaping vowels, which I don't teach, but I do believe in. That's something I do, but I think it's something very personal. So, Don, then how does that conductor, the choral conductor, then go in front of an orchestra with their chorus? Well, then you quiet down all the extra stuff that you don't need, and you um, trust people to do what the shaping of your time does. Now, that doesn't mean I don't have character the time that invites expressivity. I don't become mechanical, in other words. I see. But I do think that I have to appreciate the fact that the instrumentalists are seeing only their part where the choral people always carry around the full score with right, them. Right. And there is a big difference. And I found it fascinating that here we have choral people from day one with the full score and they only look at their part. And here we have the <laughs> instrumentalists with their only part, but they're imagining the whole score. So right. it's really interesting the dichotomy between those two. But because the instrumentalist has to know how their part fits with the whole, uh, the conductor needs to be uh, very clear about who's important and who needs to lay back and who comes to the foreground and, and when you come in and those things are absolutely essential. So uh, but there's, for, yeah. there's an yeah. element of autopilot then for your choristers, which is now I'm here and you need to remember everything we've talked about. Is That's that right. Kind of play? That's you right. Know, very interesting point you made. When we audition people, um, it's behind the screen, you don't see them, it's a very antiseptic sort of process, and it's a terrifying one for the musicians. But you can always tell when the musician is envisioning orally the whole texture of the orchestra. That's right. Interesting. It's a fascinating thing. It's like, oh, yes, they know the horns are there. They know the bass line is there. They, it, and, and it's a very exciting moment when you hear that. And it's not just, oh, they're rhythmically secure and they're in tune and they're playing beautifully. It's a different kind of awareness that seems to be projected. <laughs> this is really true. And it's true particularly for singers who tend to practice alone in a, in a room without the accompaniment. Mm. And then they hear the accompaniment for the first time and it totally throws them off. So I... <laughs> I, I really encourage my, my students from the second one to study the piano part first before they realize their own vocal line. Because, um, you know, if you're going to sing Schubert, you're, you're dealing with equal teams here. Um, and to mm -hmm. not know their part is to not know the music. And I think as David's exactly right. I think you know immediately when someone knows that and when someone doesn't. Hmm. Well, one of the things I look forward to every year is doing the candlelight program with mm -hmm. you. It's so much fun. I mean, there are lots of moving parts, different choirs that take part and soloists and a small instrumental ensemble. It's, it's an intimate space where we play. Um, 
But there's something about performing in sacred spaces that I've always resonated with. In, in England, a lot of people have always played in sacred spaces, you know, right. ensembles. Um, and so for me, it's an almost a nostalgic event. I'll bet. Um, with, with your singers there. It's yeah, it's, it's always exciting to sing in that space. And I think the music that you choose is so uh, um, appropriate for how we encourage the space to resonate, as you say, and for the singers to feel a part of something. We don't get a lot of rehearsal time, but we, we make good use of it. And thanks to your clear conducting, that really helps. And, uh, and, and, the, and the distance we have. And I, I really enjoyed the fact that last year you got to solo with the choir. That was really quite moving for us. Oh, that was, that was really fun. Where is the performance? Where, where is the space? All Saints. Oh. Pasadena. Pasadena. Yeah. It's, a, it's always sold out. We do two performances mm -hmm. in the same day on a Saturday. And it's a very festive. It, it, the hall, the hall, the church is completely decked out in, in a very good mm -hmm. way. And uh, people come to sort of get inspired for the season. Really yeah. Nice. Yeah. Well, so, could, could I hear more about your piece that you're composing? Oh, me? Oh. Yeah. <laughs> um, let's see. Where to begin? Well, it's based actually on um, Enomine. I wrote basically five Enomines. Wow. And I created a tone cloud. It's kind of tricky to actually get the cloud, um, which I use for pitch generation. I was having a problem with, um, it's atonal, but kind of not, I don't think it's an aggressive atonal. Um, I was having problems with just what's the next, when you're writing atonal music, what, what is the next pitch when it could be anything? So I created kind of a schematic, which I follow the pitches around and um, they, they kind of look like these floating clouds. And it really, it worked for me. It took that whole kind of creative anxiety off and the music just started flowing. The way of this yeah. almost sounds as if the piece writes itself, but you're making moment to moment critical decisions about pitch and texture. And right. Right. Yeah. Oh, yeah. But now I've noticed I've gotten so good at my little schematic that for the most part, it's, it follows right along with what I want to do. And I conceptualize it. So um, one movement, I, um, I would just follow the, the lines. And the lines I turned into Cantus Firmus so that that's kind of, I made my own enomine, although I do reference the Tavener later on. And, um, <clears throat> and then sometimes I would go, I also color coded it. So I would go by color, I would go vertical. Um, the last movement I decided I needed a new plan. So every time I left off with a pitch, I was allowed to jump to its matching pitch somewhere else and continue. And yeah. Very it's, interesting. It's fine. And the horn and harps and strings, it's just like, oh gooey and lovely <laughs> <laughs> yeah my doorway into that kind of music is interesting because the way you're describing it which is really helping me out but i found atonal music difficult to follow because i was using the you know the uh, teleological idea of that we're going to start with a tonic and we're going to go to a dominant and then we're going to go to a subdominant dominant and then tonic again and i'm looking for that and i'm not finding it so I, i'm feeling a little lost but it was a professor at SC, Robert Moore, who is an expert in atonal music, who said, I, you may have taken a class with him. Oh, yeah. <laughs> yeah. And Bob said one day, he says, those of you who are following this, you know, in traditional sense are, are not able to appreciate because you don't have the appreciation of a sonic icon. Mm -hmm. And it was the word sonic icon that all of a sudden just lit up my head that I could, like you're describing mm -hmm attach myself to an icon and then see how it's either manipulated or evolved or right. you know, morphed into something else. And then all of a sudden Atoll music made sense to me. It, and that, up to that point. That's know, what I was going for. And I wanted to kind of surrender. Just why is music, you know, what this whole tradition that we've been taught passed down? Yes. It's astonishing. But is that the end of it? And it doesn't also necessarily mean it's a Schoenbergian or can you also create your own universe? Tonal everything. And I, the answer is yes, if the intent is clear. And then, in I fact, when I, when I came back to, what is this thing doing? Hold on. Oh, um, when I came back to thinking about all that, it actually gave, 
the history of music for me much more meaning. Absolutely. Instead of, you know, and I see everyone kind of in their camps and weaponizing this. And I even have people tell me, oh, you're an atonal composer. I thought, well, that's not true. I just put down some parameters and compose something. I can also compose tonal music. I'm just following what the music's telling me to do. Well, that that would be very much the Brahms plan. He, he laid out very much a sense of... Uh, a narrative or a picture of where he wanted to go. And right. he used some classical attributes and then some romantic attributes and then some of his own. I mean, he was an inveterate sketcher in his, his books of, of, uh, of music from Palestrina. He'd write mm-hmm. out good ideas and then lo and behold, you're singing Bach and Palestrina and then you come to Brahms and all of a sudden you see a quote right, right from the book that you say, I just sang that <laughs> in, in Palestrina. <laughs> because he appreciated good craft and, and then he made it into his own voice. And I think that's what any good composer does. It's, and uh, kind of honors that connective thread. Right. And I think sometimes people are tricked by that to think that I need to continue this tradition in the same way, but I'm going to water it down, be ineffective, basically anesthetize it. No, it's exactly what you're talking about. You continue the connective thread, but you add to it and then you show you understand how it functions. And then you show that you have something to say. With that. Yeah, this is very much the problem in the choral world where we tend to be um, inundated with music, um, either contemporary, let me just describe it as feel good music. And it feels good and it's fun to sing and it may or may not have important attributes that will last, but it, at any rate, it's, it's the text is nice and it says a message and we get a little bit sentimental about it. But <laughs> in fact, what we teach in the first week of our of our uh, graduate choral uh, seminar is music has always been additive. It started with chant, and it's been adding on ever since. It didn't start at the Romantic period, and then <laughs> when we go backwards, we do a little less expression, and we're a little less romantic, and we're atonal. We just have to be angry and angular. You know? <laughs> so I think I think that when you take a point of view of that a chant line can be as evocative today and and lead to other meanings as uh, as an additive quality so I I for instance have been an advocate of trying to get theory departments to stop starting with the the uh, music of Bach and Fuchs and all that and go back and start with the music of Palestrina and absolutely and yeah. there you'll learn the craft as Bach learned it he learned it as a hexachord tetrachord specialist not as a music not the music of major and minor until he writes the well-tempered clavier you know I agree additive <laughs> absolutely and yeah I could go on I could go on with this tearing apart academia for hours. (laughs) I think that whole thing is just, you know. Yeah. I don't believe in departments and none of this. Yeah, it always got me in trouble when when I wanted to include everybody and people were carving out their space and saying, no, we don't include those over there. I just never kind of got it in academia. You know, when I was at USC, I was playing in the contemporary music ensemble and playing in the early music ensemble. And they both had answers for each other. And I thought, this is crazy. These people are not even on the same, they weren't even on the same campus. And they're not even talking to one another. And I thought, this is like... Well, this has been forever the problem in a lot of our institutions. I wanted to be both a singer and a conductor and an educator, and none of those three departments would talk <laughs> with each other. And Good luck. All three of my degrees are from that place, and it was hard because I, I, I had to play the game of you're my favorite son, mm-hmm. um, and so that they would give me their best. And and Because when you go in as an education major, they're not going to give you the best voice teacher. They're not right. even interested. Right. Um, uh, so I tricked them. You know, I just, I made him believe I was a voice major and I made him believe I was a conductor and you just play the game. Well, that's the trick, pardon the pun, to all of academia. You got to, you've got to trick them. (laughs) And 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 you've got to hold on to your own sense of what you want to become and what you want to get. I wasn't beholden to them to become something. Mm -hmm. I I went to SC as a trumpet major and then I ended up the singer. (laughs) That's but amazing. all the trumpet players that I was going to school with were just too fabulous. And you know, Don, <laughs> Don, Don, Green, Don Green, Bill Bing, um, I could go on. It was a long list of amazing trumpet players. And mm-hmm. I just felt like I wasn't willing to play third trumpet my whole life. <laughs> <laughs> so, Don, as you're like calling around or emailing or checking in with your, with your singers and students, how's everyone doing and what, what's everyone up to? 
I think uh, fairly frustrated and, mm -hmm. and upset because, you know, that's the one thing we do quite beautifully as, as musicians is we create community and, and mm -hmm. in our community we create beauty and, it, and you have a hunger and a thirst for it. And Although this virtual choir thing has taken on a bit of, uh, of uh, steam, none of us enjoy it per se because it's really <laughs> in the art of the technician, it's not the art of the singer. And right. so... You know, uh, it's not unlike what's happened with opera, not unlike what's happened in movies. It becomes more what the technical folks can do and less what the individual performer is contributing. So, right. I, I think, you know, I we're, we're engaged. I still, you know, talk to my JPL chorus folks every week and, and my Don Brenniger singers. And then I have lots of individual singers. And I've been teaching voice at the University of Redlands this year. So, mm -hmm. you know, keeping touch and making sure people are staying on task. And this is a good time <laughs> for us, in my opinion, to build musicianship. Right. We're I not going to build a sound. Now we, we can build musicianship and other things. So I've been teasing them with my writing, which is usually scary <laughs> <laughs> no i agree i was telling my composition students they were bemoaning this and i said H have you listened to every shostakovich symphony no okay well get back into isolation <laughs> yeah and i'm not is. joking <laughs> there it is and that's just one composer like this is a perfect yeah. time to just devour the repertoire so many so many. and then you know Absolutely. get ready to go because it's going to get you know, there'll be tons of things, tons of, tons of opportunities where we're all released. I think you're finding maybe also what I found. I, I find the teaching on uh, these platforms exhausting, more <laughs> so than in person. Because I think I feed off so much of the in-the-room atmosphere, the mm. in-room in communication. But here, you've got to really listen in. And you've got to <laughs> have a little bit of imagination. When someone's singing for me, I just did a master class for the University of Nevada, Reno, yesterday or Tuesday. And the kids are singing, and of course, you're barely hearing the accompaniment, and, and it's not ideal uh, in terms of the auditory process, but I've got to have something to work on, and so, boy, you really focus in. And although the master class was only an hour, I was just, you know, I mm -hmm. was ready for scotch and wine and everything i'm hearing that from everyone that's performing like do it you know i'm just doing composition so we just basically you know you just gave me a composition lesson which was great so when, it, when there's nothing yeah when it's just talking it's great yeah but from everyone i've heard cello i've had some cello friends that are just like <laughs> yeah yeah <laughs> So I, I do think there's a level of concentration or engagement that's required that sometimes in our, well, I'll, I'll tell a joke. <laughs> I think I've told this to David, but I was teaching a conducting class at Pasadena City College, and then we were going for the Christmas program over at the big auditorium with the symphony. And I had about 110 singers from PCC plus my dollar ringer singer. So it was a big crowd. And my conducting students were interested in what the conductor was like at the time. And I was, you know, lifting up all the positive elements so I could make sure that we had a happy experience. But I said, watch out for the brass. And they said, why? <laughs> and I said, well, in cueing, we always, we always kind of prepare a cue about a measure ahead for the strings. And, <laughs> but for the brass, we always do three measures because they have to have time to put down their magazines. And, and, and so they're all laughing and carrying on. And when we walk into the auditorium and we're oh, sitting no. there, all of a sudden one of my singers stands up and looks at me and says, Brinegar, look! And the entire row of brass had magazines on the brass. <laughs> and, and, and I said, well... That's what I've experienced. They have lots of rests. <laughs> Three bars. <laughs> that's right. <laughs> well, so. if, you're, if you're in England, in London, at Covent Garden or, or the English National Opera, they, they might be across the street in the, in the pub. <laughs> oh my god! <laughs> well, you be more than three bars. <laughs> who is who is the great uh, the the uh, Hoffman? Um, he has a fair number of cartoons with that very theme in it. <laughs> well, now everyone's on their phones, which you can oh, yes, keep right. on the music stand. <laughs> well, you know, the trend with the choirs is that when you walk into the room, they have a table for you to put your phones on. You have to oh. leave the phones at the table. Oh, gosh, that's my nightmare. Yeah. <laughs> just at, at Long Beach, when I was teaching there last year, they have a table that's all taped out just the size of a phone. <laughs> and you find, your, you find your square and you put your phone down on it, and there you go. Wow, yeah. huh. that's the world we, <laughs> we live in. Yeah.
Uh, what do you do non-musical? What do I do non-musical? <laughs> Anything uh, else? You're, you're ostensibly retired, right? <laughs> well, th th that's what I've been told five years now. But uh, <laughs> I seem to be a bit busier. You know, and I, and I take this example from my dad, David, who was an amazing educator. He truly was. Very progressive, had ideas that were well beyond his years, and now people are just starting to figure out what he was talking about. And I figured that I had enough experience and enough unusual experiences and maybe some insight that I just needed to focus in and do some writing for some years. And so now I'm finishing my third book in the last two years, and I think that might be the limit of my imagination about those topics. Um, but I've never been much of a reader outside of what I would call good literature or poetry of any other material other than, uh, you know, manuals on the voice and how do instruments work and blah, 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 blah. Yeah. I've been kind of a technophobe about that because I'm just curious how to do it better and quicker. Yeah. Um, there was a family in the 30s and 40s, I think. The Gilbert family, is that familiar to you, either one of you? Um, he was a, a British scientist who wanted to study everything on the purpose of being efficient. This is where cheaper by the dozen came from. And so he studied his family a lot. You know, how did they do their tasks? How could they do them more quickly? How could we save time? That's always fascinated me. And so it's like sitting in a restaurant and watching the waitress that is efficient and getting it done. And then the other one who's walking back and forth 10 times when they could have done five tasks in that one trip. And so I think of podium behavior in the same way. What is the what is the thing I can do on the podium to inspire the best performance? What is the physical gesture that will inspire the cleanest music making? What will mm. communicate more clearly? And it's it's consumed to me. <laughs> <laughs> and so although I love sports and I love baseball and football and I'm very much a fan of USC football, <clears throat> despite all its troubles. Um, uh, basically, I'm consumed by music. Yeah, yeah. I'm I'm narrow. <laughs> <laughs> Definitely well, not narrow. <laughs> I, I have to say, it shows in everything that you do. I mean, I, I, when I watch you or when I listen to you, I think I should really just uh, study with you for a while because it, everything you do is so illustrative and so, uh, so helpful. Fantastic. Well, I think well, we're probably all fortunate to have music at a time like this. I don't know what absolutely. I would be doing. Absolutely. <laughs> well, Don, thank you so much. Thank you. Well, Don. thank you. It was fascinating. And we'll direct everyone to your website for your um, for your books. Yeah, it's pitchperfectmusictheory.com. All one long sentence. Pitchperfectmusictheory.com. Great. <laughs> Wonderful. <laughs> Good luck. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, good luck. <laughs> That's amazing. Yeah, it's All been right. a pleasure, gentlemen. Thank, Thank you, you so much. Take care. Right. Be safe. Right. Bye bye. Bye. bye.